Good morning. Today we'll be looking at the book of Nahum, a fascinating book all about the fall of, the, uh, of Nineveh, who uh, was saved, if you recall, back in the book of Jonah, through Jonah's preaching and the work of God. Uh, but now we're looking at 100 years later, and Nineveh is about to fall, and so is the Assyrian Empire. Fascinating look, but there's more going on than meets the eye. So let's talk about it today. Thanks for joining us. We're going to do the Book of Nam, Lord willing, today. Um, I have, we have a short introductory video for Nam, and then uh, we'll discuss uh, it's a short book, three chapters only. But hopefully it'll be entertaining and interesting. It, it is an interesting book. It's all about Nineveh and Assyria. So, and that, that sounds familiar. Our pastor, uh, Pastor Justin, went through the book of Jonah some time ago. And it was the, the saving of Nineveh that that, that was all about. And this is about 100 years later. And <clears throat> the manure has hit the rapidly rotating blade because people turned away from God. And this forecasting the destruction of Nineveh and of Assyria. So I'll begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for time together. Thank you for a place to meet. Lord, bless our time together today. Open our hearts and our minds what you have for us as far as just a history lesson, but Lord, also help us to see that this is the way you deal with empires throughout the ages uh, that, uh, that come up, that rebel, that come against you and use violence against your people and they are ultimately destroyed. So, Lord, help us to find insight into your love, to your justice, <clears throat> and give us wisdom in the sermons we hear today and talk. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a second. The Book of the Prophet Nahum. This short prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before, and so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age, how he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history, and Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment 
commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the Battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. It's an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter 1, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place. And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. These minor prophets to me are absolutely fascinating. Um, we learn so much from all of them. Uh, we'll begin today. Let's see. I'm looking at my screen, so I'm going to go kind of go around the room as we read today. So, Jeff, we're going to start with you, if you're able to speak this morning. Can you read verses 1 through 6 of Nahum chapter 1? Yes. I just have to get there first. That's okay. No, no, it isn't. You're right. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and rages against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and he dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the bloom of Lebanon fades. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt. The earth heaves before him, the world and all who live in it. Who can stand before his ignorant nation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and by him the rocks are broken in pieces. Awesome. Thank you. And then this is beginning with a reminder of God's power. And again, if you remember all the language we've seen throughout Isaiah, Jeremiah, the day of the Lord, I mean, it's kind of a picture of the end times, of when the final wrath of God will come down upon the unjust and God's God's rule will be established and his will will be over the entire earth. And verse 3 reminds us that an important thing for us today, as, as important as it was for people back then, that the Lord is slow to anger. But we're not to take God's slowness to act as a license to do whatever we want to do. So by that, I mean... <clears throat> You remember Jonah. Hap Jonah happened about a hundred years before uh, the fall of Assyria. So Assyria repented, 
uh, full in sackcloth and ashes, according to the king, talking to Jonah. They repented to God. They're sorry. God forgave them and said, okay, we're not going to destroy Nineveh. You remember, it's, uh, within 30 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That was the proclamation that Jonah had. They repented. God relented. And they had 100 years of uh, relative good stuff going on. However, in that time, uh, with the removal of God's curse, they took it as a, well, now we can do whatever we'd like to do, uh, which we, uh, fortunately, in our day today, um, if we look at people that are sinning and in the midst of egregious sins, people think that, well, since a lightning bolt didn't drop down on my head, everything's okay. And unfortunately, that's not the God that we serve. God is slow to anger, but he is nonetheless a God of love and justice. So that's just a reminder. Um, verse, uh, let's check, uh, verse 7. Now, everything up on top just changed all around. So, Rebecca, you're next. You're up for verse 7, one of the, one of the keynotes of the Bible, in my opinion. Okay. How far are you going to read? Just verse 7. Okay. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Amen. That's a, let me read this in the Amplified. The Lord is good, a strength and stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows, recognizes, has knowledge of, and understands those who take refuge in him. And that's something we can build our lives on. As born again, children of God. We, are, we fall into this category. God knows us and knows us in a biblical term. As in Adam knew Eve, it's a term of intimacy, as an in intimate knowledge, where he knows, doesn't just know our name, but he knows about us. He knows us and loves us and takes care of us. And he reminds us that he is that, uh, he recognizes those who take refuge and trust in him. He will protect them. He's a a strength and a stronghold. So it's just an amazing verse that could, that rings throughout eternity of who God is and what he does for those he loves. Let's go to verses eight and nine. Uh, let's see, Al, it's your turn. With a overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. And again, the, <clears throat> the video we just watched mentions that in the actual text, Nineveh and Assyria is not mentioned. However, in the Amplified, they're very distinct in saying that's talking about Nineveh. But in, throughout history, um, God is a overwhelming flood and he will take care of uh, take care of those who are against him um, and again the way I look at this too <clears throat> Assyria will not rise again to trouble his people Israel a second time so looking at it two ways number one throughout history God overrides and is an intimate part of history unlike our founding fathers as you recall our founding fathers were basically deists. They believed that, not all of them, but some of them were Christian. But basically they were deists thinking that God set everything in motion and then kind of like a clock. He wound the clock, took his hands off, and kind of sits back and watches. Here, the Bible says, no, that's not true. God is an intimate part of history, an intimate worker in the affairs of men. So he's a hands-on type of God. Verses 10 through 12. Let's see. Who's up next? Dr. Chen, it'd be your turn. <clears throat> For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord. Though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. Amazing. 
Um, verse 13, Stu. <clears throat> and now I will break his yoke from off you, and you will burst your bonds apart. Um, the king sh shall, and I'm, Jeff, I'm not as good a pronunciation as you are. Shalmaneser is the actual king of Assyria that defeated the northern kingdom. But if you remember his son, Sennacherib, came against the southern kingdom. Um, and here God is saying he's not going to be successful in defeating Judah the second time, if you will. Um, commentators differ on when this prophecy was delivered, but most agree this was delivered during the siege of Jerusalem, and it was given to um, uh, Hezekiah, that it was a prophecy that was delivered at that time, saying that the Syria would not be successful. They were surrounding Jerusalem, as you recall. There were 186,000 troops surrounding Jerusalem, ready to destroy it. And God intervened, as we know, and uh, not one arrow from that whole army ever made it inside the city wall. Uh, and I get that again, Jeru Judah, Jerusalem, southern kingdom. Uh, he defeated the northern kingdom, but did not defeat the southern kingdom. That was reserved for Babylon. Next on our list would be Mike and Laurie. Are you still there? Are they gone? Yeah, we were back. Oh, okay. All right. You guys are moving in and out today. Computer yeah, problem. Yeah. Mike, if you would, just let's read verse 14. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. For the house of your gods I will cut off. The carved image and the metal image, I will make your grave, for you are vile. Mm. Again, specifically, again, Amplified. Um, Amplified points this toward the Assyrians specifically. But as the opening uh, video talked about, we're not just talking about one kingdom here. We're talking about the nations as a whole, that God is against evil and against people uh, that are against his people and against those who are worshiping other gods. Um, and interesting, the last line, I will make their temple your tomb. In the Amplified, it says, for you are vile and despised. So again, it's a, just a fascinating look uh, at God, God's justice coming in. Because remember, the Assyrians were idolaters. Um, and I have to throw this in. Um, I don't know, do any of you receive the Babylon Bee? It's a, a daily email, a highly, um, it reminds me of Mad Magazine. It is satire to the nth degree. And there was a, uh, yesterday, it said that uh, the worshipers of Molech outside the Supreme Court were mourning the fact that uh, they were cutting themselves and, and doing dancing before Molech because uh, they were going to stop uh, abortion. In the Supreme Court. I just, again, uh, satire to the nth degree. But Moloch, of course, was a god that demanded sacrifice, human sacrifice of children. So, anyway. But God is against that, obviously. <laughs> Lori, can you read uh, verse 15? And that will finish chapter one for us. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Mm. I think that kind of speaks for itself. But I, I am honored and warmed by the beginning. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings. Now this is talking about a serious death who publishes peace. And we are reminded in the New Testament uh, that are blessed are those who bring good tidings and, and peace. And they're talking about something entirely differently, talking about the good news of Jesus Christ and about peace among men of goodwill and who trust in him. So it's a dualism. Yes, we're happy that Syria, Syria is being dropped if you will. But again, still, blessed are the feet of those who bring good tidings. And that harkens back to in ancient Israel when they see someone coming, uh, or ancient times, the runner was coming to bring news to the city. Uh, generally, if a, their, their runner was bringing good news, they were celebrated. 
in some kingdoms, if they're bringing bad news, they kill the guy. Which, which means you wouldn't want to be the messenger bringing bad news. Right? But this is a special blessing God's talking about on those who bring good news. Now we get into, and the Amplified has an interesting uh, outline of chapter two, <clears throat> and just a one liner it says, Then the prophet Nahum sarcastically addresses his message to Nineveh. So, begin chapter two. Let's read verses one through six. Uh, Bill, I believe you're up. You're not going around this. Oh, way. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, okay. Katrina, you're up. So, he who shatters has come up before your face. Man, the fart. Watch the road. Strengthen your flanks. Fortify your power, mighty. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the empty end, the empties have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men are made red. The bailiff's men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the days of his preparation. And the spears are branch shields, the chariots raises in the streets, the, they jostle one another in the broad roads, they see like torches, they run like lightning, they remember his nigh, they stumble in their walks, they make haste to her walls and defend is prepared, the gates of the river are open and the place is dissolved. All right, and if you remember the way that the actual capital of uh, Babylon was destroyed by cutting off water, here's again talking about um, a flooding, and there's actually a name uh, uh, 2 6. <clears throat> um, the gates of the river shall be opened, the Diava and Adia Adiava, or Lysias and Capus. Both, which according to some writers, Nineveh was situated in gates, the, the rivers, okay, um, which lay nearest to the. Okay, Nineveh was situated, or the gates of the city, which lay nearest to the river Tigris, are meant, or that the river itself, plural for the singular, which overflowing, broke down the walls of the city for two and a half miles. <clears throat> so, what they did, we, when Mike, you've stressed this in your Bible study. Um, in the old days, what they would do to, to make a gigantic wall break down, they would build fires and the moisture inside would eventually explode the wall. <clears throat> well, in this case, all they had to do was flood the wall and continue water would, uh, that would make the water, make the wall break down. And then they were, a two and a half mile opening came in so they just walked in to, to destroy the city. So it was an easier, uh, an easier uh, destruction and building, it would take sometimes months that fire to get hot enough to blow the entire wall up. And again, the second part, the palace dissolved um, by the enemy, meaning the palace of the king, which might be situated near the river, the temple of Nishrak, the Assyrian deity or Jupiter, Belus, uh, signifies a temple as well as a palace, so that it'll all be broken down. It's just kind of fascinating how that all happened. And we'll read verse 7 through 10. Keith. It is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away from female slaves, moan like doves, and beat on the breast. Nineveh is like a pool with water draining away. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the soap, plunder the gold. The supply is endless, and the wealth from all is treasures. He is pillaged, plundered, stripped. Hearts melt, these give way. Bodies turn, every face rolls pale. Mm. And again, it is decreed, or the Lord has determined. That means judgment from God. Um, the interesting thing, too, here, number one, Nineveh is sacked. And as you recall in the video, um, Nineveh was built on the, the backs of the oppressed, uh, on the backs of people that were they were unjustly treated. And if you recall, from our earlier teachings, uh, Assyria was probably 
Babylon was bad. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was ruthless. But Assyria was, when people heard that the Assyrian army was coming against them, when they were in their strength, um, entire cities were known to commit suicide because when the Assyrians would come in, uh, they would ruthlessly and they would torture and maim and slowly kill the people. It was just the fear of the Assyrians was such that some cities they could take over by just hearing they're coming and we can't stop them. So in entire towns and cities would literally commit suicide because it was, they would rather do that than suffer the torture that's coming. That's scary in today's terms when you think about it, but interesting in the fact that here they were mighty and strong and here God is turning the tables on them and saying, oh no, we're going, you're going to be, in verse 7, Nineveh is stripped and removed. Again, and uh, like a, Nineveh, like a standing pool of waters, her inhabitants, her inhabitants are fleeing away. And the, uh, the people that were defending Nineveh were received fear and ran instead of standing and fighting. And again, as we've gone through the Old Testament, the, both the minor prophets and the, uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah, uh, a curse from God uh, involves leadership. It also involves the fighting men losing their will to fight and just being, lose, again, losing their will to fight. And a blessing from God, when you look, in the, look ahead to Revelation or any other place that one man uh, inspired one Jew inspired by God is equal to 10 other fighting men. The, the lion of the tribe of Judah gives heart to those who are fighting and in, encourages them and inspires them and empowers them to be a mighty warrior. David comes to mind. Again, inspired by God, blessed by God. Um, David was, in fact, a bloody man, but he was a mighty warrior. You didn't want to meet David in battle in a sword fight because he was win. He was good. Um, we're moving on now. You just read. We need we're verse 11. 11 and 12. Where is the lion's den, the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and the lioness went, where his cubs were, with none to disturb the lion? For enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses, he filled his cave with prey and his dens with torn flesh. And when Nineveh was powerful, they were willful rulers. They took what they wanted. They took from whoever they wanted. They destroyed whoever they would. There was plenty of food, and things were going very well for them. Um, that's that's all past now. On um, verse uh, thirteen reads. Behold, I am against you, Nineveh, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. And I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no more be heard. From an earthly standpoint, there are more, no more terrifying words for any nation to hear about them that I am against you. Because any nation that God has been against destroyed, even to his own people. If you go back to um, the destruction of Israel, um, again, we've heard all about that. And God has uh, visited many times over the, the, the curse on Israel because of their rejection of him, their worshiping of other gods, and ultimately the rejection of Messiah. So, but again, I would, the only words... Um, there are only words that, in my opinion, is more scary than I am against you, is those four words that you never want to hear that I preached about a few weeks ago. I never knew you. That would be, I, I'm against you is very bad. And if God will fight it. And God, throughout scripture, I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth going into the churches of Revelation. Uh, the churches that are apostate, that are against God, that are not following him properly. He, God says, uh, I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. I will come again. A church, and I do church in air quotes, 
so that God can be against people here in this time. But again, the only thing worse would be an eternal I am against you, which is the term I never knew you, or those who don't know Christ. Makes it uh, even worse. So now we're going to down to chapter three. And verses one through four, going up on my screen here. Al, I guess we're going to start with you. All right. Oh, sorry, Jeff, you're next. Okay. Verses one through four on chapter three, Al. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the uh, prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, they sell us nations, though through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Mm. So none of the sin, number one, they were against uh, nice people, if you will, or God's people. Um, they were ruthless. They treated the poor abominably, they stole, they, they uh, took everything. But the other thing, the other point here is, uh, God, God is making is talking about in verse four, the harlot trees of Nineveh, it says in the Amplified. Uh, and even God even calls them here in the Amplified again, the well-favored harlot, the mistress of deadly charms, okay? Uh, bewitched, if you will, or, or witchcraft. Uh, not only was she physically, she, meaning the nation of Assyria, was not just uh, physically bad and, and physically ugly, but spiritually they worshipped other gods and did not worship the true God. So they, part of the reason that they were uh, destroyed was spiritual. Now, here's the, the thing that I, I'm kind of, the commentators stress here. Nineveh spread idolatry throughout the throughout the known world. Um, again, God looks at not just physical what you do, but the spiritual leading people astray. And if we recall, Israel was set up as a beacon city. Now, if you recall in the Old Testament, they didn't get a charge to go ye there forth into all nations, preaching, you know, preaching the good news. They were called to be a light where they were at. The temple was to be the center of worship. Okay. Here in what God's talking about here, if you will, is the fact that the whoredoms or the spiritual whoredom of Nineveh, they were out physically spreading it around. Israel was supposed to be a beacon, a city on a hill an outpost of the Lord God, a central place of worship. Uh, but, and again, commentators, not unlike Assyria, Israel went, and terms used, whoring after false gods, <coughs> and, pay, and did pay, and is still paying, the ultimate price for disobedience to God. So Nineveh spread the, spread the bad news. Israel was supposed to be a light but they never really fulfilled that light. Even though there's good examples of, uh, I think in the New Testament, uh, the uh, eunuch that Philip came upon um, that had gone to Jerusalem, was a God believer and was reading the scrolls. They, there was some interaction with the outside world where people would come to Jerusalem to worship God, but it was never, never fully realized as a center of worship for God that it, that it should have been. We're going to do verse 5 through 7. Um, Jeremy, would you read that, please? Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Jeffrey I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. I've only called you Jeff five times this morning. Behold, I am against you, 
says the Lord of hosts. And I will lift up your skirts over your face. And I will let the nations look on your nakedness and the kingdoms on your shame. And I will throw filth at you and treat you with utter contempt, making you a spectacle. Then all who see you will shrink from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will mourn her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? And again, it's a, a curse from God. And it, the, the language here, the visual image. Okay. If you pull a skirt over someone's face, two things happen. Number one, they're blinded. They can't see what's going on. And number two, their nakedness is exposed. So you have two bad things going on. God's saying, he is going to do that. I will lift up your skirts over your face and let the nations look on your nakedness. That's scary. And the, and the kingdom on your shame. So God, again, is coming against him. This sounds really, sounds really familiar. Um, and let's look at, I'd like to read, I'll read this. Jeremiah 13, verses 24 to 27. Now, this is the curse that God spoke against uh, Israel, against Jerusalem. 13, verses 24 to 27. <clears throat> Therefore, I will scatter you like chaff driven away by the wind from the desert. This is your lot. The portion measured to you from me, says the Lord, because you've forgotten me and trusted in false gods and alliances with idolatrous nations. Therefore, I myself will retaliate, drawing your skirts up over your face, that your shame of being clad like a slave may be exposed. I have seen your detestable acts, even your adulteries and your lustful names, whinnying, if you will, after idols, and the lewdness of your harlotry on the hills and the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem, for how long a time yet will you not meet my conditions and be made clean? <coughs> Excuse me. And, the, and when I look at this and I, and I read these two scriptures together, to me, the largest difference has an eternal perspective. Number one, God came against Jerusalem. They were his chosen people. And we today are his chosen people. If we continue disobedience, God will pull our skirts over our head and expose us as the frauds that we are, if you will. And, but the big difference to me here is Israel was God's chosen people, and God promises throughout Isaiah, Jeremiah, throughout the minor prophets, that he eventually will redeem Israel because they are his people, because of the promise that he made to Abram, Abraham, or usually Abram and Abraham. The promise that they are his people, and eventually they will be saved. There will be no such saving or salvation for Nineveh. God's utterly destroying the Syrian Empire. We don't now. There's Syria is out there, but you haven't met any Syrians lately, because they're, they're the people. As the people, they are destroyed. They're gone. I'm talking an awful lot today. If anyone has any comments, please just speak <laughs> up. I'm, I'm, uh, <sighs> Let's look at that verses eight through ten. Going around the room, Doctor Chen, would you read verses eight through ten? Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart, the sea and water, her wall? Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street, for her honored men uh, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. Again, God using here an example uh, of Egypt. This is fascinating. <clears throat> History tells us that three years before Assyria attempted to destroy Jerusalem, so they're in their full strength, Assyria, the nation. They laid siege on Thebes and destroyed it. And I just, I, my comment here is 
God is reminding the Ninevites and us as and the rest of people in the, in the world, if you will, that if God is against you, there's no hope. So God's just holding an example. Thebes was a great city. It was destroyed. Nineveh was a great city. It's going to be destroyed. And if God is against you, there's no hope. But if God is with you, who can stand against you? That's, that's a whole nother. That's the promise we have as believers in Jesus Christ. And it, I'm often reminded today something we need to do is keep short accounts with God. We are in the end times, okay? But we've been in the end times for 2,000 years right now. We have no idea when our Lord's going to return. No idea what's happening as far as God's timeline. Unfortunately, his clock, it looks entirely different than the clock I have. The clock I have says, come Lord Jesus. John said, even so, come Lord Jesus. But it could be another could be to today, it could be before our Bible study is over. It could also be a thousand or two thousand years hence. So I, I don't know. But we're reminded to keep short accounts with God at all times because He loves us, He calls us to repentance, and He calls us to obedience. Okay, all of His people. And those who are not obedient, unfortunately, suffer things like this. Um, it may not be individually. God may not destroy people in this way, but he destroys them in a different way. And if you want to read how God does that, I always point to Romans 1, read the progression of what happens to those who turn away from God and don't acknowledge him. And it's not pretty. And to put it mildly, it's ugly. Uh, verses 11 through 13. Dr. Chen, Mike, would you read next, please? <coughs> Uh, you also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops are, are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bats. Virus. <clears throat> Again, if you were had a city gate, the last thing you wanted to have was the gates wide open when the enemy was coming. But but the Lord, it is as if with a curse, God has made their gates virtually wide open. They're going to be destroyed. Um, verse 13 is telling, and again, we talked about this a little earlier today and in the past. Behold, your troops in the midst of you are as weak and helpless as women. And then the gate, the gate feet just said wide open and so on. God is showing that his wrath on, on a people is like being intoxicated. Intoxicated people make poor choices, are self-confident, even when they have nothing to be confident in. Uh, and I, I think of France uh, at the beginning of World War II. France was confident. They had the Gamelin plan. General Gamelin was the general above all generals. And what did it take? Less than 30 days for France to be destroyed? Well, they were, their gates were wide open and they didn't even know it, if you will. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15, Maury. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your defenses. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you down and, like grasshoppers, consume you. Multiply like grasshoppers. Multiply like locusts. Mm. And God, in, in this case, the Lord is looking down from heaven. Think about this. He's taunting them to do their best. Taunting them to, okay, get the border stuff going. Get, the, get that wall built extra strong. Do what you have to do. Go ahead and get, take care of it. However... It's not going to do you any good because here's what's going to happen. You will be destroyed. Um, it doesn't matter what they do. When God is against them, when God is against the people, when God is against an individual, nothing can stand. The only good way out is repentance for individuals, for us, and for nations. Repentance. And uh, uh, as we come on this prayer vigil tonight, um, prayer vigil tonight, shameless advertorial, 
tonight at uh, five, five, 5 to 8 is a prayer vigil here at Knox. All are welcome. Come for five minutes. Pray at home during that time um, or come for the whole three hours. But as we gather together for prayer, we need to be praying for the turning of our nation and for a revival to happen in our nation. For as a nation, we turn back to God. And as individuals, people turn to God for in repentance, uh, in sackcloth and ashes, and trusting in his justice. And if we turn to him, he turns to me, I will no wise cast out. God promises that. So as individuals, we need to keep short accounts, repent, stay truthful to God and in obedience to God, work with him. Um, and we need to pray for that to that end. But again, if you're cast for destruction, no matter what you do, God will act and cause their end. And that's what he promises to do. And in the, in the end, it did. Um, and we finish up today, verse 16. Uh, Katrina. You have also proved your merchants and more than stars of heaven, the locust plunders and the flies of the way. The commands are that's like. It. Oh, okay. That's it. That, that's, I'm just reminding you, when I read, heard this and read this, I'm reminded of a passage in Isaiah. Now think about this. We read that again in the Amplified. You increased your merchants more than the visible stars of heaven. The swarming locust spreads itself and destroys, then flies away. And I'm reminded of this passage as far as the fall uh, in Isaiah. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 18. I'm going to read it in the King James. <clears throat> because it's, to me, it it's just means more to me reading it in the King James. How thou art fallen from heaven... O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, that they see thee narrowly looked upon the instead of these saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners, all the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. And I'm reminded that again, the Assyrians, proud, arrogant people, ungodly, God hates pride above all sins. So, like the, now the vision from Isaiah is against Babylon, referring to Lucifer, how he fell from heaven. Jesus refers to what I saw Satan fall from heaven like a, like a falling star, fall out of heaven. Uh, God hates pride above all. And again, the, the, one of the sins of Assyria was pride, that they, they were it, they were the, the ruler, if you will. Verses 17 through 19. Keith, could you read that? Yeah. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away, and no one knows where. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather. Yeah, they uh, nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? And uh, just a reminder here that God's judgment on Assyria is final. Um, thank God his judgment on us was put on Christ. And his sacrifice paid our sin debt. However, Assyria had no such, they did not turn back to God like they had hundred years earlier, they were uh, willful, they were arrogant, they were ruthless, and God came against them and destroyed them. As God has done in throughout history, as it pointed out in the video we started off with, the um, we are reminded that God is against those who are against him. They were against those whom he loves and against the poor. Uh, throughout history, again, God stands up for the poor. 
Jesus, when he was here, stood up to the poor. That's it. That's the whole book we got through today. Any comments? For, I've talked an awful lot. I hope somebody else has something else to say today. There's interesting parallels to our own nation. Yes. That we started off with looking at some God was for us. But we turned and we can actually face this end as well. So this nation just could disappear. I'm reminded, and that's that's a good insight, Keith. Think about it. I don't see the United States, unless you want to go through some mental gyrations, the United States is not mentioned in prophecy. So chances are, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we will we will an end. That, to your point, yes. And the same thing could happen to any, and any nation, any nation that comes against God. How many years after Jonah is this... Uh, is is Nahum? Hundred years, Stu. Hundred years after the Jonas, uh, after the turning back to God, uh, they fell. That's that's what I read in the commentators. So it wasn't that long, right? A couple generations, and we're reminded again that within one or two generations, our nation is. Think about when, and we've talked, Mike. We've talked about this a hundred times. We were growing up. Everybody went to church. All the kids went to Sunday school. You know, you went to Sunday school, didn't you? Oh yeah. You went to Sunday school. How many kids do you see? We have twenty children in our Sunday school, and probably seventy-five percent are from families outside of Knox Church. Now, it means two things. Number one, we're an aging congregation, but number two, people are not sending the kids to Sunday school anymore. Uh, we have turned in one in two generations co almost completely. My, I, my kids went to Sunday school. My kids went to church. You know, we don't see that today. You went to church when God was out. Yes, that's, that's, yeah. that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. You're going to church. You're going to church. <laughs> you know what? That's what I'm going to say because you live in a European's house. Half of them, the parents go to work. They going out, they laying up, enjoying all the benefits, and and too many of parents are scared to be parents to their kids instead of you know they need discipline, and then you sending them to school and act like the teachers are supposed to take you do your job when you're at home and when your kids get out of line, it is you just like God loves us, He disciplines us, mm -hmm. and parents are getting away of are not disciplining their kids because they're afraid of, you know, the kids going to leave, they're going to, or they're going to be, or be, file charges, be, or be file them, charges, or file charges against them. And stuff like yes. that. Corporal punishment today is uh, verboten, if you will, yeah. it, it's according to the law, you're, ch you're being child abused yeah. if, you're, if you're spanking your child. The uh -huh. Bible clearly tells us we are to discipline our children. My grandmother, uh, you ain't doing nothing. You going to church on Sunday. You, better, you can't do nothing else if you don't go to church. And I'll say this too, though. In my generation, now my, we're talking 50 years ago, um, I went to Sunday school. My parents went to church and Sunday school. However, the majority of kids that I went to Sunday school with, their parents didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. They sent their kids to church, but they stayed home. Yeah. Um, and again, it was, if you go back a generation before that, the parents and the children went to church. So it's been a slow over 50 years and a, over the past 75 years, let's say, an eroding of church attendance and of people looking to God for rule and instruction and uh, a way to live. Uh, that's we've gotten away from that. The way has gotten us. So look at this. Oh, oh, <laughs> Our right. society is destroyed. Yes, based um, on the fact that we have we have no guidance, no rules, no no nothing. And what's really sad, when you think about it, we are the most in the history of the world, there has never been a nation as prosperous as the United States of America. I mean, we, the, the poorest among us, now, discounting the homeless, there's, I mean, that's another whole can of worms. But if you're, in, if you're destitute in our nation, if you're poor, we'll give you a, a wage. We'll give you money. We'll pay you extra money if you have children to help feed the kids. Uh, as Again, as a nation, we are, we're prosperous. Um, However, there will come a time when the house of cards falls. God help us when that happens. 
you the towels, we giving all this money to I mean, I know we gotta help Ukraine and everything, but I was just listening how they giving up some more weapons, where the money coming from. So we get more in debt. We right. gotta give billions of dollars for the weapons. trillions. Trillions. We are, we are trillions, twenty-one trillion dollars in debt, mm -hmm. last I heard. So and that's only getting larger. And last year, here's some here's some great news for people that are on Social Security. Last year was the first year Social Security paid out more money than it took in. Um, that was projected to happen. Uh, there was a the trust fund, uh, which that's kind of like the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, that I want to get political, but um, we Social Security paid out more than it took in, so it's not a good sign that you're on Social Security, which I am. Disability. Any more comments this morning? Awesome. I, I, the, the great book. Great book. All right. On to next. On to next. Next is uh, Obadiah, another smaller book, um, fascinating book. And then the trilogy they mentioned at the beginning the trilogy of Micah, Nam, Obadiah. Obadiah will be next, next week. So we'll continue on to, through the Bible. Um, I re Recently, and when I send out my notes today, I'll send you the name of it. There's a movie out that came out last year uh, that really talks about the Bible and why should we study the Bible and is the Bible really the word of God. Fascinating look. Um, there was a time when you could do it online for free. If I find the link, I'll send it to you. But I'll send you the name of the movie in case anyone's interested. And what it will do is help you reinforce the fact that we need to be in God's word and what God's word is, and that is, in fact, God's word. So, so what, what are we doing next? What are you holding up? Obadiah is next. We're not doing um, a we, we already did. Did Obadiah? Do you mean Habakkuk? Thank you. Yeah, Habakkuk. good. Throw mm -hmm. something at me, yeah, Jeff. Please. Okay, Habakkuk's next. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bye, uh, Stu, I saw you holding up a sheet there. Was that you trying to tell me? <laughs> Stu's gone. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, Mike, would you pray for us? Sure, uh, Father. Be with us, with this great group of people as uh, we go out, uh, go our various ways. Uh, we ask for hedge of protection. We ask that uh, you would uh, cause us to keep our, our minds and our hearts focused on you throughout the day and the coming week. Um, and to just uh, be with you and you with us, uh, that, we, that we might... Uh, just be aware of your presence in everything that we do throughout the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone.